we're just wrapping up another fun day in clinic. So I wanted to do a quick YouTube video on a topic that I see in my office every day and that is jowls and lower face laxity and people who come in who despise them, can't stand them, want to erase them or want to prevent them from ever happening. So this video will just talk about why we get jowls, why we get this little laxity in the pre-jowl sulcus, why it starts at different ages, why they happen and how you can kind of reverse the changes that cause them to treat them and prevent them as well. So I'm a full-time doctor and a part-time YouTuber, a quarter of the time YouTuber. So whenever I film these videos, it's just in my office. It's not perfect. It's not fancy. I don't have a studio. I don't have an amazing camera, but I just want to get this content out to you guys because these are topics that I see every day as a cosmetic dermatologist. My practice is in Newport Beach. So these are just things that come up every day that people usually have questions about or are their primary concerns in aesthetics or you know changes in the aging face. So I try to do these little tidbits of topics so that maybe it'll provide information for you that will be um, helpful in trying to decide what treatment options may be right for you or what preventative measures that you can take from having certain changes happening as our face goes to the aging process. So before I move on, I should probably introduce myself. My name is Dr. Stephanie Kappel. I'm a board certified fellowship trained cosmetic dermatologist in Newport Beach, California. And I just try to talk about topics that people are asking about, that people are posting about, and just things that I see in my office every day, like the major concerns that bring patients in. Like today I'm talking about gels. Sometimes we talk about under eye bags. Sometimes we talk about fine lines and wrinkles and lasers and peels and minimally evasive procedures to make ourselves look the very best we can at every age and so that's the point of my whole YouTube channel and thank you so much for joining my YouTube family so subscribe if you haven't already and hit the notification bell because I drop derm information and derm knowledge every Sunday and then I post on my shorts as well pretty much similar to what I post on my Instagram stories but aesthetics and dermatology is such a rapidly advancing field there's so many new technologies that are always coming in the future and week by week month to month year to year it's a rapidly changing field which makes it really excited so I try to keep you guys in my pocket and bring you along this journey with me and to try to bridge the community gap between the medical community with us dermatologists and physicians and you know people who aren't physicians or aren't in medicine and just patients and people who want to learn more about skincare so that's the purpose of my channel and even this week we have our academic meeting um, one of our largest dermatologic meetings that's coming up and they're gonna be going over some new and exciting procedures lasers injectables things coming down the pipeline and um, I'll always take you with me, keep you ahead of the game, and keep you in the know with respect to advancing technology in the field of cosmetic dermatology. Okay, so on the topic of jowls, first of all, what are jowls? I hate that name, jowls. Pre-jowl sulcus, skin laxity, gathering of the tissue in this area when we lean forward or when we're from this side and we don't like our profile because of this situation that's going on here. Why does that happen? So there's a couple reasons why that happens and it's sometimes multifactorial, many different contributing reasons why the gel area in this area starts to kind of lose its elasticity and its tensile strength. Usually in our 30s, gets worse in our 40s, starts getting even worse in our 50s, and so forth. Sometimes these changes may occur earlier in some people, sometimes they may occur later. And it all has to do with your genetic blueprint, your genetic background, your exposures that you have through a lifetime, um, you know, how much sun you've had, what your bone structure, what your anatomy is like underneath the skin, and all these contributing factors create changes in the face and can predispose you to having you know, things like gels or other changes that happen with the aging face. So basically, as we get older though, and we gain wisdom and have birthdays, as I used to have an attending who'd say, don't say it's getting older stuff, say it's the person's getting wiser or having birthdays. Whatever you wanna call it, we're all aging. It's happening to all of us. So what happens is the skin thins and the subcutaneous tissue thins as well. So when I say subcutaneous tissue, what does that mean? Underneath the skin, the fat pads thin out. The muscles become atrophic or thinner. They're not plump and thick like they used to be. The bone that the muscles and fascia and subcutaneous fat and skin that are resting 
the thrusting underneath that starts to resorb and get thinner. If you look at an aging skull, I remember this in anatomy, first year med school, when they show us a skull of like a baby, a child, an adolescent, someone in their 20s, someone in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and, and so on, the whole shape of the skull change, and that's because changes, and that's because you have something called bone resorption. The bone starts to lose volume. It goes from a thick mandible, a thick, you know, maxillary area, the whole, the whole skull thins out, the orbits of the eyes get wider. So that is why we see changes in our skin. The skin is just basically like a tablecloth and the bony structure is like the table underneath it, holding it up, giving it that structural support. So as the bone and the muscles and the fat start to disintegrate and get thinner, the draping skin over it starts to hang. It doesn't have that structural support that it used to, to kind of keep that jawline area nice and tight, which is why we start to see early formation of the gels. So that's one thing. Then also the epidermis and the dermis, which is the two most superficial components of the skin, also thin out. And we lose that ground substance in our skin that used to keep it nice and firm and bouncy and tight. The elastin fibers, the collagen fibers, these are what we call the extracellular matrix proteins. But a loss of these proteins lose, make the skin lose its elasticity and lose that smooth contour. So on top of all these changes that are happening, the skin starts to lose the collagen and elastin you know, kind of bouncy texture that it had before. So not only does it not have that structural support, but the skin starts to sag as well. So how do we reverse these changes or how do we minimize these changes from happening? So by thickening the skin with increased synthesis of collagen and elastin, it's gonna keep the skin nice and tight. And now how do we do that? There's energy-based devices, which I'll get into in a second. There's lasers, and there's also skincare products that are gonna upregulate things like collagen and elastin synthesis, which is gonna make the skin more tight and more taut and more, I guess, bouncy, if you can. I've heard some people describe their skin after using certain skincare products as bouncy. So that's what we mean, bouncy skin. Increase hyaluronic acid in our skin. Increase the ground substance and all of that structural, those proteins that we used to have chock full of, you know, our skin was chock full of these proteins before, and now we've lost that, and so the skin becomes, instead of being like a thick, almost like a comforter, it becomes a thin, wet sheet. So, because these changes in our skin happen, happen with time, we can hopefully slow that process down by having the opposite effect, stimulating it and upregulate our skin cells and our fibroblasts and our keratinocytes to act and behave younger by making more of these structural support proteins that they kind of stopped making or had slowed down the process of making. So what kinds of procedures can help stimulate collagen synthesis, elastin synthesis, and hyaluronic acid and volume restoration by inducing our bodies own regenerative processes to make these structural support proteins back. And so laser resurfacing, you know, there's all kinds of lasers out there and it can be quite confusing and I'll do a whole different video on different types of lasers if you guys wanna hear about that. But things like Fraxel, Halo, ablative, non-ablative laser, you know, of course CO2 resurfacing is the most aggressive and the least aggressive is something like a clear and brilliant where there's no pain, no downtime. And then there's Fraxel Restore, which is a non-ablative laser, which is kind of in the middle. There's not that much downtime, but there's a little bit more downtime than clear and brilliant. And, um, you know, the results are a little bit stronger than a clear and brilliant, but maybe not as significant as a fully ablative CO2 or erbium laser. Not to confuse you guys with lasers, but lasers are, a way that we can induce the skin to make collagen and elastin to smooth and improve texture and to tighten the skin. So there's energy-based devices too. Now, how is that different from a laser? Energy-based devices use heat in the form of either radio frequency, uh, microfocus ultrasound, different ways to get heat into the skin to stimulate and wake the skin up to make these structural support proteins. So unlike lasers, which is collimated light, it's just a different mechanism to get the skin to do the same thing. It's kind of like going to the gym. You can build muscles by doing the heavy weights, the lighter weights, you know, resistance bands, machines, there's different ways to do it. And sometimes if you do a combination of different methods, you get a better result because it's a more well-rounded, more comprehensive, complete result. So energy-based devices and lasers pretty much do the same thing. They induce the skin's regenerative processes to make the skin texture and contour look better, but they do it by different mechanisms. And then we have what we do at home. So in-office procedures, 
performed by your dermatologist or plastic surgeon or you know nurse practitioner or wherever you go to get your procedures done in the office they're usually higher grade medical grade more powerful treatments but what you do at home on a day-to-day -day basis is actually really important too to help with the texture of the skin to help you know now it's hard to say, you know, using just a skincare product alone is not going to erase the job. So you definitely need, you know, a tidy device or some type of filler or something to help make that look better. But what we do at home is really important too. You have skincare products that are going to stimulate collagen. So my skincare line that I formulated myself, which is four SKUs right now, it's my baby. It's been my passion project for the last several years, but I've perfected it. The RxR Retinol, um, the vitamin CFK, whatever by MDR, which is my line. So or any skincare product that has been shown to you know stimulate collagen and improve the contour of the skin will help with that area as well. So sometimes it's beyond something that a skincare product or a laser or an energy-based device can accomplish. And sometimes that is when we have to do something like filler or thread lifts in this area to kind of contour out the gel or the pre-gel sulcus kind of laxity that we get here. Now the ways filler work, and fillers are tricky because even as a cosmetic dermatologist, I'm very, if you're a patient of mine, you know this, I'm very conservative when it comes to filler because the answer to correcting certain ailments isn't by just putting a ton of filler into the face. You never want to do that. That's not a good look. That's how you look weird or not like yourself, and that's when certain providers that may not be highly trained will just pump people up with fillers, and that's not a good look for anyone. But fillers do have their place for example, by replacing bone resorption, by adding a little bit more structural support to the jawline, to filling in the discrepancy of the pre-gel sulcus here. We usually use a little velour here. We could use a little voluma back here. Um, there's different fillers that are engineered specifically to do certain things and achieve certain goals. So by doing a little contouring with filler, up in this area to pull it back, you're replacing the bone or the volume or the subcutaneous tissue that has been lost to kind of pull that back up. So that's how fillers help the jawline and the jaw area look better. So it's not usually the only thing that we'll have to do, but say somebody's starting to get a little jowl area here, you put a little filler here, see how you do. If it takes it away, great. If the jowls are a little bit more moderate or severe, we may have to do a little bit of filler from up here to kind of pull that back. It'll make it look better. If it's still not gone, then we could do something like a little bit of thermage or a little tightening device or even thread lifts. Now I know people are going to have mixed reviews about thread lifts. So here's the thing with thread lifts and I have a whole nother YouTube video on this topic. It's very operator dependent. There's some states where estheticians are doing thread lifts and that's not to say anything negative about an esthetician, but they don't have the experience and training, you know, 10 years of training of learning the the exact dermal plane that someone needs to be in to have a great thread lift result. You know, you can YouTube how to do thread lifts or go to some weekend long course to learn how to do thread lifts and that provider is not going to have the same outcomes as somebody who's very well versed in surgery and knows their anatomy well and has done thousands of these cases. So filler, um, thread lifts have their, their place and they actually work pretty well and when we place them right here to snatch that area up, it has a great impact on um, removing that little pre-gel sulcus gathering the gel area or lower face laxity. So these are all different treatment options to kind of help address the gels, whether it's tightening device, lasers, fillers, thread lifts, or just using simple skincare products that can help improve the texture of the skin by increasing collagen and elastin that has been lost. So I hope that shed some light on the jowls, why they happen in different non-invasive procedures that we could do to make them look better. But also sometimes, you know, as a minimally invasive provider myself, sometimes something is beyond my level of expertise that I can do with minimally invasive treatments or ser services. And sometimes I have to refer them to my plastic surgery colleagues because surgery may be the only thing that it's going to make a patient happy or um, meet their expectations with respect to outcomes. So to each his own, there's so many different treatment options out there. Again, mine are more minimally invasive, but sometimes surgery is needed. But you know, even for myself, I don't think that that's some, a route that I would ever wanna go down. So I'm gonna stick with the minimally invasive procedures and 
keep doing Thermage and using good skincare products and hoping to keep this area tight for decades to come. And that's what I wish for all my patients too. So I hope this um, provided some information that may be useful to you or you can share this video with anyone who may find it useful. Again, thank you guys so much for following and for subscribing and we will see you soon. Let me know in the comment section what you guys want to hear about. Like this video if you um, found it useful and let me know what else you guys want to hear about in the comments and I'll be sure to do my next YouTube video covering that subject as well. Love you guys.